Well, welcome everybody. Uh, we have the joy of having our friend here with us, Professor Dr. Reverend <laughs> Nelson. <laughs> oh my God. Yes, you take, you take that off. <laughs> you take yours off. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we're blessed to hear this week and next week about the sacraments that we lift up, that bless our lives, that mark us forever by our Lord. And so I welcome you to question whatever you wish to, or to just sit and listen. My friend. Thank you. <laughs> so can you hear me well? Is the, is the volume all right? Can you all hear? Okay. Just to make sure. Thank you. Uh, thanks again for the invitation. I've been here uh, sharing with you. Many times. How many times? <laughs> I can't count. Okay. I lost count. I don't have enough fingers. <laughs> but it's always, always a pleasure. And I'm very grateful, especially for the cross. And I have made so many uh, friends in this way. And when I come, I like to also be part of the survey, uh, as I just did. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, Dori, uh, our friend, asked me to speak about baptism or the meaning of baptism. Mm -hmm. And in order to speak about baptism, we need to speak about sacramental meanings. What is a sacrament? And, uh, why do we do it the way we do it? Etc. Uh, so uh, she always has me to come six times in a row where I would say no no more than two. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. <laughs> uh, I <love> so, <laughs> so I thought uh, wise to first speak about the sacrament, uh, the what, the why, and the when. And I'm sharing with you a PowerPoint presentation. But let me let me tell you uh, something, you know, more like a personal testimony. Through time, Maybe it has to do with the fact that I'm getting old, like anybody else. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have appreciated the life and participation of the sacrament more and more, and the meaning of the sacrament. But, all, but the sacraments do not, do not stand by themselves. When we speak about baptism, when we speak about the Lord's Supper. Actually, when we speak about confession and forgiveness, which in the book of the Lutheran Confession says that it can be called a sacrament as well, mm -hmm. even though we don't normally do that. But it's successful. So when we speak about those events and those activities in which we participate, we're really speaking about the meaning of the church. The church practices the sacrament. Uh, we come to the church or we gather at the church, even at a distance, like through video conference. We're still a church gathering together, practicing the sacrament, uh, speaking about the So more and more, I have come to appreciate also the meaning of church. What does it mean to belong to the church? What does it mean to be church? Now, um, in seminary, uh, you don't see often a class dedicated just to say the fact. Hmm. They are just like one topic within a survey of doctrine or systematic theology. Uh, but eventually, I personally, and I'm not alone, of course, I saw the need to create a class just on the sacrament. Actually, it's never just about the sacrament, because as I said, it's also about the meaning of the church. So the class I have I've taught like three times in the last probably five years is about word, the meaning of words, since for us, we that are so Actually, valuable. Everything else, the church, the sacrament, faith itself, right? The word is there always to make these things happen, possible, meaning. So the class is called Word, 
the spirit, because again, at Lutheran, we always insist that wherever the word is, the word of God is present, the spirit is right there at hand to make that word be understood, believed. So word, spirit, and sacrament. Now, if you put these things together, word, spirit, and sacraments, you already have a basic definition of what is church. You need people, of course. You need people to a, a community, a gathering, however big or small, to read the word, preach the word, celebrate the word, uh, pray to the spirit, receive on today the, the gift of the spirit. They are for the church, for the community, for Christian people. So there you are, people celebrating the word, people that have received the spirit through baptism and the gift of the spirit that ought to be put into practice, right? Uh, and active, and then the practice of access to the sacrament. And that's what the church is all about, the people who engage those events and those texts, including reading the scripture, right? So anyway, that's a, that's a personal testimony in the sense that more and more I have come to appreciate and do more reflection on, let's call it for, for the sake of the argument, those elements were stated and stacked. So, yeah, so I just want to emphasize what was just said because I don't, it seems so simplistic and it may be, but it's so powerful. So I thank you for putting it into that progression of, of what we are as a church, mm -hmm. starting with the word, the spirit, and then the sacrament. Mm -hmm. I mean, they spread out, but. And I that's how you tell I'm a Lutheran, <laughs> <laughs> among other things. <laughs> So, Aren't we all? <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Now, if I may, I would like not just to speak and present or show some PowerPoint, but if possible, and I know it's not so easy to do, it's easier in the classroom, right? People presently, but uh, if I may ask, just uh, a brief in your own words, and I invite those uh, online, I see, well, uh, not counting myself, there are up to be like these, like seven probably people uh, from somewhere. Um, what's your understanding? What is a sacrament? Just briefly, what 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 do we call a sacrament? <coughs> Something that there's a, a, a command about yeah. by Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. Can uh, folks at home hear what other people in the classroom are saying? Repeated, I think. Just in case, then uh, uh, already someone said something that Jesus told commanded us to do, us to commanded do. us to do, yeah. mm -hmm. and rightly so. Uh, what else? Uh, I think in the in the case of people at home, they can use the raised hand. Yeah, right. You can yeah. raise your hand. Your and hand and Elizabeth, you are you, you can monitor that with yes. with me. Yeah, okay. So that. others in the what is a sacrament? That's that's very good. That's very basic. What you just said. And, and if you're at home, just remember to use the when you want to answer. Anybody else? Here. Well, the word the word has to be present. This is Bill Irwin. Hi, Nelson. Hi, Bill. Good seeing you. Yeah, good seeing you too. I, I'm sorry I'm not there in person, but I hope to be there next week. Excellent. Good. But I, the, the sacraments, uh, one of the elements uh, for it to be a sacrament, is, you know, first it's instituted by Jesus Christ and the presence of the word yeah. and the spirit. Except, well said. You said it better than I. I took your class. I took your class, Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then allow others to speak. Uh, very good. Well said. So let's see what I have for you okay, in the Linda. presentation. Linda wanted to say. Oh, Linda, I'm so sorry. I, I was just going to say I always um, heard that with a sacrament we take every day things like water or bread or wine and make them sacred 
beautiful sacrament. They are very simple elements. Common, <clears throat> almost you could say mundane. The water. Don't forget that we also use many times oil for baptism, yeah. right? Yeah. And not just including baptism. And uh, is, there, it, is there not some transformation that occurs within us? That's that's the promise that the sacraments participation in the sacraments promises to touch us, transform minds and hearts. That's why we have to, in the case of communion or in the case of confession of forgiveness, again, in the Book of Concord, the Lutheran Confession says, we may call a confession an absolution, especially the absolution, the forgiveness, a sacrament. So, mm -hmm. again, things that we go <clears throat> to. In the case of baptism, it's one baptism, but we are all invited to remember our baptism. If you were baptized as an infant, well, you won't remember the exact occasion, but it's remembrance of the meaning, remembrance about the promises that baptism bestows, the kind of grace that baptism plans. And then in our confirmation, we confirm our own Again, it's better than I. It shows. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yeah, it's called affirmation of baptism. Through confirmation, we do affirmation of baptism. Actually, every time we do the, the sign of the cross, Luther said, we do that in remembrance of baptism. That's why we Luther still do the sign of the cross, because Luther said, it is a good thing to, to do it in remembrance of the of baptism, not because there's a certain magic in the gesture, but because what it stands for, I believe that was a Christ, right? The Christian life. Uh, so what is a sacrament? Uh, the word actually means holy promise, a sacred promise, sacramental from the Latin, or a holy Sign. See, again, the emphasis is on the promise, what the practice, what the, what, what the activity promised them. Anyway, what God promises to all, of course. It's traditionally defined as an external sign. So the elements, like in the case of the, the, the bread and wine, external elements. Now, when we hear the word preach and we are touched, something is happening, right? So where is the element there? Well, the element there would be the, the voice of the one preaching or the reading loudly of the text of the scripture. So there's always some kind of external element, meaning external to the work of the spirit, but the spirit uses those elements, external sign of divine grace, or as the word united to an external element, the water, bread, the wine, the person preaching, teaching, but not just preaching and teaching, the person witnessing to someone else. When you testify about your faith to someone else, that's why Martin Luther, among what he called the means of grace, he included the mutually edifying conversation among Christians, meaning that you can be also a means of grace to someone else by your witness to the Christian faith. So you are an external element, right? <laughs> but the Spirit is there to make you testimony will be being heard, effective, someone else's life. The sacrament grants what it promises. So what is the number one? There are many promises by God, but what is like the number one? My favorite. Your, your <laughs> sins are forgiven. <laughs> the forgiveness of things, the, the turner, the core, is the number one promise. But God promises as uh, Pastor Keith said today, 
abundance of gifts, abundant life, blessings of all kinds. Those are promises. But again, the number one, like the core value here is your sin are forgiven. I have to say, Nelson, that's one of the reasons I love that we offer it every day. Because I need that forgiveness. We need to we hear that. that. Yeah. We know that God forgives once and for all, forever. But we need to be to hear that, yeah. to remember that, to be told again, yes, these things are forgiven. And remember the source of that forgiveness, right? It's God in Jesus. So in the sacrament, God is truly present for us. Again, another promise that God in Jesus has promised to be there for us, with us, in us, through this practice of baptism, Holy Communion. And again, every time we hear a word of forgiveness, Jesus, I'm oh, sorry, Jesus is, I thought, is really given in communion as the Spirit is in baptism at work for all. And again, that's a very, not just Lutheran, that's a Catholic emphasis, Orthodox emphasis that Jesus is truly given. in it. that when we participate of the Lord's Supper, when we were baptized, you truly participate of the life of the Christian one. And in baptism, we'll promise, again, speaking about promises, the granting of the Spirit for life. Like on top of that, so to say. Word and sacrament, we speak, for example, when we ordain someone, one of our pastors will always say, ordained to the ministry of word and sacrament. Now, bear in mind that when we speak about word and sacrament, these are not like two separate ways to go. Because they, 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 in a sense, they cannot be separated, right? The word has to always be there for the sacraments to <coughs> work, right? And the spirit has been promised to be always next to the word to make it effective. We see it. Believed by you. Uh, so, but the word and sacrament are two means of experiencing the presence of the living Christ with us. So, it's not just about communion or about baptism, it's about uh, coming to the scripture, studying the scripture, reflect, reading, speaking about it, listening to the sermon. Yes, but as I said even uh, before, also you witness your faith, your testimony of faith, of healing, of blessing, you name it, to other people. Uh, the, the presence of the living life is there. Again, it's all about God and Jesus promises to us. Our senses, and um, this is something that I have learned more and more to emphasize through time. The way we worship, the way we practice the sacrament, uh, the way we uh, speak about the scripture or the way preaching is done, the way we decorate the, the central, right? It's all about engaging the senses. And in the past, we thought that it's all about sight, right? Vision, and just hearing, and the other word, uh, the colors. Uh, but it's also about smell. That's why in, in some churches, they use incense. Yeah, but what about the flowers? What about baked bread? Mm -hmm. Well, my wife wants baked bread for communion, and 
because she's fancy. She added so many rosemary and something else, and mint, <laughs> and then it took the whole temple to smell. And then everybody was distracted throughout the service. Okay, you don't have to do it that in extreme way. <laughs> <laughs> it was well mean. <laughs> but yes, the bread, it, I mean, fresh bread, right? And I know now there is a limitation. We understand that. I'm going to tell Sarah yeah. you said that. <laughs> <laughs> she knows. <laughs> but again, it's, it's the smell, the sight, the sound, right? What do we say often uh, during communion, the, the presider of communion, when all the prayers are said and the blessing. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Not just see or hear <laughs> what I'm saying, but now taste. Taste. So again, is the more the senses are involved. And remember, the number one sense actually is the whole body. So people hope to the rhythm. I in the scripture, especially in the older testament, but also in the new testament, there's a lot of references about dancing and moving or being moved or emotion. So again, involving all the senses. So that's why I said that all the senses are involved in the experience of the celebration. And of course, you know, the feeling of the water. And we call the waters of baptism a bath. There you go, yeah, right? Uh, again, for, uh, for cleansing, we call it a cleansing, right? Uh, and the more stable of, of the spiritual food, but it's really food, I mean, it's, it's bread after all, right? Uh, for you, water, oil, but also speaking about the body, the gestures, you know, that we're not just like a the Lord be with you. Uh, let us pray that we say, the Lord be with you. Uh, hey, let's share the peace or bless these elements. Look, right? Or as I saw, don't read. <laughs> don't stop. <laughs> I'm control myself. <laughs> no, again, it's, it's also about colors, signs, gesture. No, we're in COVID, but you know, it, the embrace, uh, the handshake, right? Uh, we'll, we'll, the, the, the kissing, or, we'll, we'll be back, right? We'll be back. Bill, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to mention that uh, our church in Minneapolis was a liturgical church and uh, they used incense. When you were talking about smells, um, not at every communion service, but at festival services, Christmas, Easter, things like that. They used incense, and that that definitely added to the sense of smell in the uh, in the whole experience of the sacrament. Yeah, and the meaning of the incense is given both in the Old Testament, but also in the Book of Revelation. And the Book of Revelation says, because John asked, what, what is that, all that incense on God? Oh, that's the prayers of the saints. So it has a, a, another meaning that have been added by the by different tradition. Dori. Um, I grew up uh, going to many services, not Lutheran, um, Catholic mostly, where incense were. And we have a, a memory, a, a smell memory or an incense, so that when I smell something that's not even in church, but I walk into a store like I don't know if they're selling yeah. different lotions or whatever. <clears throat> it triggers a memory mm -hmm. in me of being in church mm -hmm. and we and and smelling this incense. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very uh, visceral, very physical. Ah. And I, I love that. I love the fact that all parts of my body are involved in worshiping God. Mm -hmm. I, I grew up in the Episcopal Church and just came to the Lutheran Church three years ago. And in the Episcopal Church, and we always bless ourselves. I see it, I saw it much more in the Episcopal Church than I do in the Lutheran Church, but they did. And that does stay with you. When you leave church, you can still, still smell the incense. It, it just stays with you. And tradition has added other meanings. Uh, for example, in the Episcopal Church, they use the word with stems, the table with the incense, or the where the gospel book is. The lectern, set, or even the congregation uh, itself. Uh, I even go down the aisle 
bottles of water during a baptism and sprinkle it on. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. that's a, another, that. yeah, yeah, another Greek that. law that is you used. Feel even more part of the baptism yeah. that you're getting the water sprinkled on you. I find very interesting. I mean, it's very comparable, yeah. both churches, but there are some differences. Yeah. One of those different <clears throat> I could do also with the with the architecture, for example, in the church of that you can actually kneel and in, in, in your pew because yeah. and churches where you don't have that. Of course, so the, the architecture, the size of the church, incense, for example, if, if, if temples are bigger um, because some people are allergic and this and that. Now they have hypoallergeny, but yeah. so it's a decision that every congregation, there's so many things. Right. Out there, so many rituals and gestures or uh, practices that can be, you know, an act or not. But what matters? Also, <clears throat> why we do it, right? Why we do it? Uh, that we understand the uh, so that it it doesn't sound arbitrary, right, or in or an imposition. But something that people can embrace and find the meaning. So that really that's what matters the most. Uh, Jesus in the sun. Of course. Ultimately, it's all about Jesus. Okay. So the sacraments, and um, this is what you said at the beginning, right? The sacraments have their origin and reason in Jesus Christ. Uh, there is the reason Jesus at the end of Mass was saying, you know, go and act, but also teach them, <laughs> right? Make disciples. All those are, are commandments too, right? Mandates by the reason Jesus. Uh, both Jesus during his earthly ministry and the recent one also uh, taught us to forgive things. So during his ministry, he said, you know, if you forgive, the sins, they will be forgiven. And then the recent one, he was again forgiving things and asking the disciples to do so. So we have both uh, the whole Jesus, let's put it that way, teaching about the importance of forgiving other instrument of forgiveness. So the sacraments themselves are instruments of forgiveness because Jesus is in the sacrament. Jesus is there. From Jesus' own activity, as I was saying, you know, in the practice says in his own life, after all, he was baptized, after all, he gave meaning to the, the Last Supper, right? Keep doing it until I come again. To this, uh, to his command to practice these events, to his promise that he himself will be there for us until we. Again, the sacraments have their origin in Jesus Christ. Uh, the sacraments testify to oops, another type of, to the recent Christ as Spirit. It is Saint Paul who calls uh, the recent resurrected Jesus living Spirit. So again, Jesus as living spirit is actually in the sacrament. That is participation with Christ through the sacraments. Again, it also includes forgiveness of sin or absolution, uh -huh. or just listening to the word being proclaimed as we do the thing. They're called means of grace. And you, you have heard this word many times. Love that word. <laughs> Means, or you may call it channels or conducts of grace, meaning that the sacraments bestow, grant the grace that they promise. That's why we say that the sacraments are effective. Effective in one sense, because they effect the grace and the forgiveness that they promise, that they proclaim. That's why we insist that 
we, everybody, all Christians, should participate, should come to the table, uh, to be uh, participate in the uh, community confession of Jesus, uh, to insist that these practices convey the promise of forgiveness. So that those now again we're in COVID, <laughs> everybody can be here at the same time, but even through the video conference medium, we hear the, the word proclaim, we can participate in confession and forgiveness. And as we're doing, participating in uh, the supper for your own home, right? Uh the, the question about the word sacrament. I apologize if you already answered this, but it went right by me. Um, I recall you told us the origin of the word. When did that historically first begin to be used? That's a, that's a very good question. And I, I'll i get the actual answer. If the answer is about a specific century, um, we know of uh, they, uh, many things but were. You want to address this later? That's fine. Yeah. Well, <laughs> early, uh, many things were practiced very early, before we even had a written testimony. Right. For example, the besides Saint Paul, besides Saint Paul, in 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 the letters to the Corinthians. Uh, we have to wait then until like mid second century when one of the Christian apologists, who we call Justin Martyr, because he was martyrized, but right? Justin wrote in his apology, the, the title of that uh, Defense of the Christian Faith, he wrote a full account, the fullest account that we have, and this is from the year roughly 150, 150. He has a full account of the gathering, the assembly, what they did when they came together, that they listened to the teaching, <clears throat> they commented on the scripture, and then they came to the table. And uh, then they took uh, the elements of the table to those who couldn't come, you know, to the, to the homes. But they gather offering goods to be distributed to those in need. So it's a it's a full account. So we know that the idea that the table and the practice of baptism were considered holy things. Holy things was already there. Now the word sacramentum because there it's later. Uh, but it is already exists in St. Augustine. St. Okay, Augustine right. is really already they, the end of the third century, fourth century, <clears throat> beginning of the fifth century. So, so again, it's not that it, it may have been there before, but unless we have a written record, we go with written record. Mm -hmm. For history, historically. Well, thank you. Thank so, you. But they, there was a sense of holy things very early. That's why uh, Gordon Lathrop's book on liturgical theology, the first of the trilogy, is called Holy Things. There was a strong sense. Bill has his hand up. Oh, Bill, go ahead. I was just wondering is it, in light of what you just said, is it safe to say? that the sacraments are not an end unto themselves. They are a means to another end, which is the manifestation of grace. So in other words, you don't take communion just for the sake of communion. You're taking it in order to have access to the grace of God yes. or, or the manifestation. We already have it, but it's the, it's, it, my point being that it, it it's not just for the bread and the wine, it's for what they represent, what what they what they give us the mean the uh, the grace that we're looking for. Yes and no. As you may okay. Good, good academic answer. <laughs> yeah. Yes, in the sense that yes, we are means 
ultimately is not merely about the bread or the wine or the great Jews. Remember Methodists and many evangelical churches, uh, Moravian churches, as I found, I found out, they use great Jews. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. So and so yeah. so see ultimately it cannot be about the why because it no. could be great grape juice. And if they don't have grape juice, I guess they will use apple juice in mm -hmm. other places. And mm -hmm. actually there was a, a a bit of a controversy uh when Lutherans came to the United States. I learned this uh with uh, Gordon later, uh that uh they wanted to be identified differently from Roman Catholics. And if Roman Catholics were using red wine, then we use white. <laughs> so, no, really. And so, the, actually, the longer uh, tradition among Lutherans going back to well, as they came was the use of white wine. Oh my gosh. But eventually, you know, because ultimately it's not really about the wine or the color of the wine, there's no magic there per se. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, and now, as far as I know, probably most Lutheran congregations use the red wine, as far as I know. Uh, so, but if they use white wine, don't be scandalized. Actually, <laughs> in, the, in this soil, that's an older tradition of Lutheran. Using the, the white wine. I thought I learned to use uh, when I was for a couple of years, I was uh, uh, like applying at the seminary, Lutheran seminary. And then I found out that they were using uh, sherry. You know, oh, sherry? No. Why? Yes. Why? Because they have a longer yes. shelf of wine. <laughs> and if you're going you to use like half a bottle, let's say, for the sake of the argument, this Sunday, and I'm gonna wait the next Sunday, or in the case of the seminary, Wednesday, and then you have to wait until next next Wednesday. You know, it's it's a waste. So you know, so Sherry has a, a longer shelf life, <laughs> and is it red or is it white? Actually, yeah. Sherry comes from white yeah. grapes, but they they leave the. The, yeah. the skin yeah. for a longer time, but, and then yeah. it, it comes like what am, amber. Yeah. Amber. amber. I yeah. saw some. Uh, uh. I was I was thinking. It always seemed to me that um, the earthly elements that were used, or that are still used, were what people had in their ordinary lives. So that it, so that God's presence is right there in the midst of our ordinary lives. We don't have to go out and buy something. It's already a part of our lives. Water is a part of our lives. In those days, wine was served at meals and, and bread was at meals. And so to me, that's a message that, you know, you don't have to do anything special here in the ordinariness of your everyday life. God is alive and present. Yes. Well, that was part of Pete's sermon today about, no, I'm sorry, Gary Sprague's prayer that God. Christ comes to us in the midst of our ordinary celebrations as well mm -hmm. as sitting in the church pew. You know? Any all of our lives. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Ordinary <coughs> element. Common <coughs> element. Very common, as common as they come. And yet as necessary in the sense of, I mean, what's more basic for life than bread? Yeah. And again, whether it's wine or grape juice or apple juice. Right. Water. <laughs> no water, no life. <clears throat> period. But also, as you said, that ordinary people, very common people like us, are the ones who are being called to faith, to follow Christ, and become instruments for the Jesus or the healing um, the comfort uplifting all people's lives. So it's not just an ordinary life. We ourselves, ordinary people, that, you know, that, that as St. Paul says, St. Paul says, God did not call the wisest and the strongest and the best of the best or whatever we want to call them. He actually 
for the low and the whole. Yeah. So there you go. Exactly. Uh, so that's why bread and wine or red juice, it's like they will just stand on the air. Very terrible air everywhere. Like that. Uh, so it is the gospel itself that lies behind the spectrum, the gospel of grace, of course. And that works to then. Again, this is repetition, the gospel, the sacraments convey to us the promise of the gospel, divine grace for life and the forgiveness of sins. Again, among the many promises of God, but these are top on the list, so to speak. Now, this is a, maybe a little bit controversial for some people that we, if the community that we call the church has been promised by God and it's God who sustains, meaning that the church is not an accident. As we look at believe that the church is by the will of God. Again, not an accident. Remember, many people have said, oh, Jesus proclaimed the reign of God and then the apostles created the church. Yeah, I have heard that many times. Or, oh, some people blame St. Paul for creating the church like it, it shouldn't have happened. No, it's not like that, actually. That we believe that even in Jesus' ministry, the idea of a community that was called eventually a church was there already. It's actually the result of what Jesus worked for. So, so if the church is also promised by God or revealed, by God, and if the church itself is a means or an instrument of word and spirit, and the church is the one also called to practice, distribute the sacraments, so there is a sense in which the church as a holy promise of God is a kind of sacrament. And, and I'll explain a little bit more, so as not to create confusion. So the church can be said to be a sacrament of Christ present in the world. That's the basic meaning. The, and that's what the church is called to be. Uh, the, uh, how, how do we say many times? The, the hands and feet of Jesus. Now, right? Mm -hmm. So, a promise of good things, a promise of grace or benevolence or service to the community. Well, that's the meaning also of what the second part promising and delivering to us. But also the church is the body from which the sacrament flows to the practice of the sacrament, right? And of course, then we sometimes discuss or converse, sometimes argue about what's the best frequency, for example every Sunday or once a month. Yeah. It used to be just seasonal, right? Like yeah. for like Muhlenberg and his company, they practice communion seasonal, meaning four times a week. Right? Yeah. And then it, once a month that lasted for decades, right? Yeah. About Lutheran. And then in the last, when I was a seminary student in the mid 80s, there was already a, a, a big push Towards weekly communion. So, if we count that list of the 80s, 40 years and we go pushing to weekly. Now, I don't have the statistics. I don't know the percentage of, say, ELCA congregations today that have uh, weekly communion. I think it should be high, very high, because as far as I remember, I've visited many congregations, and probably only a couple of them, or three of them, have still monthly communion. Now, during when a congregation loses a pastor, say, and there's a transition period, and they cannot get someone presiding at the table every Sunday, they change to twice a month or to once a month. But that's out of the festive season. But I think that by far, Lutheran Church has to uh, weekly 
the human. So again, uh, emphasizing the importance of access uh, uh, of the, the sacramental meal. Uh, the community and communion, I mean, the church is both a community, meaning a family, people together, but also a communion, people who are in communion with God and with one another, uh, that, that we call the church, is God's gift to humanity, uh, the completeness of grace. That's why I, I tell my own students, I mean, especially the younger generation, they tend to be very critical. Sure. And we always have been. We all are critical in one way or another. Uh, I always say, uh, do not despair. Uh, first, the, there is a promise by Christ, by Jesus himself, that the church will prevail till the end. Yeah. That not even the gates of hell will prevail against it. So, in other words, that there is a promise that there will be a church. Now, Granted, I don't mean to say that all Lutherans or all Methodists or all Episcopalians and Saturday will always survive, I mean, but there will be a church. Of course, we want to be there as well, because we have a message, right? Well, what uh, is the history? What is the history of the church? We have a history. And I have said to young people, you know, part of the church, the history of the church is to be critical. Mm -hmm. you know? And But yet here we are. But I love that phrase of yours, the concreteness of grace. Grace, because it's, it's a body. Solid. It's, it's, solid, it's a yeah. people who yeah. are called to express, to live in the world yeah. that grace. The very grace that we have been given. Yeah. So we're here by grace. Uh, remember, we have, we have been saved. We believe, we are told by St. Paul that it is all by grace. Right? And the reformers emphasize that as well. So, uh, not despair of the church. I mean, uh, actually, Pastor Keith said something very beautiful at the end, right? <laughs> but it doesn't matter the, the latest crisis uh, or, or challenges or, hey, we'll, we'll go through. We'll, we'll be here. We'll survive. Uh, uh, have faith. No, right. Basically, that's uh, yeah. right. go ahead. I have to say, the church is not a building. Yeah. It's not reduced to a building or merely a building. Okay. The building has a purpose. Yeah, yeah. but we can still have the church. Uh, we can still have the church. Uh, well, uh, when, when we couldn't come at all, yeah. step into the building at all, uh, everybody was home, right? Yeah. So the, the church gathered. Yeah. And we can gather. Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Well, whenever two or three are gathered in my name. And there you go. Yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, it's a, it's a, for years. So that's a promise. Yeah. By Jesus. Right. See, speaking about, there are many promises. And that's another one. There are two or more. Hey, I'm there. I'm, 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 I'm next to you or in you or with you right there at that moment. Another problem. So that's church. No, right. what, what I was trying to say is mm -hmm. that the building is visibility, mm -hmm. embodiment also. And so, uh, I mean, it could be big or small, painted blue or gray or, or white. I, that, you know, a big step or not. And that's, that's cosmetic, right? But the point is visibility. That is a point. That's how we speak about the ordained ministry is we call it, actually, the Lutheran Confession call it public meaning. Oh, really? yeah. Public. That's the, the term that they use mostly. Yeah. Is the call to the public ministry. Why? Because it's the, the public faith, visibility. Meaning throughout history, the church has also emphasized visibility. We need to be seen. Not just here, of course, out there as well. Throughout time. Many churches have been hidden for people have been in church in mm -hmm. many hidden places, mm -hmm. not known to others. Mm -hmm. See, that moments of church. crisis, persecution. Mm -hmm. You see, mm -hmm. what about when it was like the the uh, what is called in, in the Middle Ages? There were waves of the plague. 
imagine, you know, somebody could gather, right? Uh, and then it's done, and here we are again, making the testimony visible. Actually, when the plague arrived in Wittenberg, uh, Luther, uh, the town, also the town pastor, Guggenhagen, uh, and a few more, they stayed, they asked all children and uh, mothers and fathers with family to leave the town. But Luther and the pastor of the town church and a few others stayed watching for the others at their own risk. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that Luther led and Guggenhagen fled or Jonas, no, they stayed at their own risk. Most of the faculty also was asked to leave. Those were families. Again, they, they took care of women and children. They, they, they sent them to save places. But there were already sick people, and, and someone had to offer some services. So a few stayed behind with them among them. Uh, so it again is so that the sick and those trouble or in despair could see someone. Like Bonhoeffer. Uh, right. And many other through Christian history, right? witnesses, public witnesses. The church celebrates, practices, and distributes the sacrament. As we said before, sacramental meanings and practices. Uh, I had a, a professor. Uh, King Lowell, who used to say, remember, there is no logic of the sacrament. Yeah. By that, he meant that the sacrament express in different ways the mystery of God. We preach one baptism. Peter, you don't need to be rebaptized. I tell you, the word anabaptist, from which the word baptist comes, means rebaptized. Oh. I mean, the people who insisted that if you were baptized as an infant, didn't count. You needed to be rebaptized as <laughs> at all. What eventually became so called believer baptism, what is what at all. Now, I always say to clarify, people say, oh, Lutheran uh, preach infant baptism. I said, no. What we teach and preach is one baptism. We do not re baptize. But we baptize whoever. If you need, if, if you're an infant or six or 50 or 90 and you haven't been baptized, we practice baptism. So just to clarify, because there is confusion about that. Now, there are reasons, and we're going to talk about that next week why we baptize infant, again, not just. Right. But it, there's a meaning, a, a theological meaning to that. It is practiced differently according to its frequency. See, come to the Lord's Supper as any as you are able. Now we are offering uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, there are different ways of distributing the sacraments. Look what we're doing now, right? Uh, Stay in your feet. Uh, you know, that's fine. That distribution varies through time. Sacraments effective by grace in diverse ways. Finally, sacramental theology, what we call a doctrine of the sacraments, or theology of the sacraments, as in the Lutheran Church, you may say is a mix of biblical witness, what the scripture says about baptism or the Lord's Supper, about confession of forgiveness, etc. Examples from the Christian tradition. I mentioned Justin. The, the apologist of the Christian faith and his description of what they did. And he speaks about gathering up and also taking of those goods to those in need or visiting the sick at home with bringing communion, etc. And we still do. And also, well, sound judgment. I mean, we can make decisions. I, someone was telling me, oh, Elizabeth, oh, we had. The liver where the bread was on top, it was so hard to open. Yeah. Uh, oh, we change it to this one now. It's you know, like yeah. you reverse it and sound judgment. What works <laughs> best for us? We can do that. The stages that we make as to its practice. And 
Let me just do a full screen here. I wasn't watching the clock, sorry, uh, but last next week we'll speak more specifically about baptismal meaning and practices. And then the question, why do we use uh, baptized infants? It has a uh, deep meaning, actually. But again, not just for use what we actually teach is one because we're not going back are there any okay thanks nelson see you next week thank you bill Take okay you. good to see you bye. take care questions <laughs> bye bye anybody else uh in cyberspace <laughs> any... bye. 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 bye questions or comments from the others I have a comment. Uh, we thank you. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. Yeah, and your you presentation you. was so clear mm -hmm. and so insightful and so powerful at the same time. And I thank all of you who are here and all of you who will be listening to the recording later. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a gift waiting for you. Mm -hmm. So. I forgot about the recording. I hope I didn't say anything bad. <laughs> will come back to haunt me. <laughs> thank you so much. My pleasure. See you all next week. I'm looking forward to next week. Bye. Bye. Take care, everybody.